All right, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming tonight. My name is Christy Puckett Williams, and I am the statewide campaign for smart justice manager with the ACLU of North Carolina. And I am joined tonight by my esteemed colleague, Daniel Bowes. Daniel, you want to say hey to the people? Yeah, thank you everybody for coming out. Glad to be uh, here with you, Christy. Thank you. Daniel is our policy and advocacy director. So that is short for Daniel is my boss. So please and say nice things about me so um, that he continues to enjoy working with me because we enjoy having him here with us at the ACLU. Um, again, tonight, our webinar is entitled The Toxic Roles of District Attorneys in the Carceral State. And so if you were with us the last time, um, this will build upon um, what you heard about the carceral state last time. So we're about to go ahead and get started. Let me start sharing my screen. Just a moment, you guys, because I got to learn how to work the Zoom properly. There. All right. Present. All right. And so just to go over briefly, who is the ACLU? If you don't know, I don't know where you've been for the last 100 years, but just in case you are under a rock, I will refresh your memory. The ACLU was established in 1920 as a nonpartisan nonprofit organization. We work in courts, Congress, the North Carolina General Assembly, and deeply in communities to protect and advance everyone's constitutional rights. Uh, we have a nationwide network of offices. And right here in North Carolina, we have more than 30,000 members who take up the toughest civil liberties fights with us. Um, and so hopefully some of you all in watching tonight are some of our members and long-term supporters. As I stated at the beginning, I am the campaign manager for the Campaign for Smart Justice. The Campaign for Smart Justice is an unprecedented national effort um, that was taken up by the ACLU to reduce the jail and prison population by 50% and to challenge the racial disparities in the justice system, um, in the criminal legal system. And so that is the work um, that we work on um, a lot uh, at the ACLU. And the way that we do that work is through renegade advocacy. Uh, and it's a series of tactics and strategies that we use to further our objective of abolishing the carceral state. And so there are several ways that we do this. We love collaborating with people and communities to discuss and understand the nature, mechanisms, and harms of the carceral state. We amplify the voices and perspectives of impacted people by connecting them to decision makers at strategic junctures in the policymaking process. And we fiercely, when I say fiercely, we fiercely confront key decision makers and bad actors in strategic ways. And we do all of this to build power in our historically marginalized communities and groups. So, what is the carceral state? You will hear us referring to this a lot, Daniel and I, the carceral state. And I, I read a quote from a book called The Prison and the Gallows. The Politics of Mass Incarceration in America was written in 2006 by Katie, I don't know why I call the lady Katie, it's Marie Gottschalk. And she says that a tenacious carceral state has sprouted in the shadows of mass imprisonment and has been extending its reach far beyond the prison gate. It includes not only the country's vast archipelago of jails and prisons, but also the far reaching and growing penal punishments and controls that lie in the never, never land between the prison gate and full citizenship. As it breaks apart families and communities and radically reworks conceptions of democracy, rights and citizenship, the carceral state poses a formidable political and social challenge. So North Carolina's modern carceral state seeks to maintain and sustain the goals and values of systemic racism, authoritarianism, unrestrained capitalism, puritanical social influences. And so drawn on these ideologies, North Carolina policymakers and all actors in law enforcement criminalize, punish, police, exploit, and or eradicate an ever-growing range of activities, behaviors, conditions, characteristics, preferences, relationships, and identity. I want to go back and because that was a lot of words just to say, but the key point in that is to eradicate an ever growing range of activities, behaviors, conditions, characteristics, right? So the carceral state exercises control over people's bodies, their behaviors, the community's resources, and um, it exploits and controls. When we say mostly marginalized, I'm just going to break down 
Black, Brown, poor people and communities. Um, and we know that there are resources that are available to us that actually provide care and protection. Um, North Carolina itself, though, is a carceral state based on its forever desire to reduce a person's autonomy and agency over their own body. And that's really, all of that slide could be boiled down to the carceral state reduces the agency and autonomy of people and the control that a person has over their body and the way in which they behave. So tonight, y'all, we got a lot to go through. I know I just ran through that very quickly, but I want us to get deep into this conversation, the meat of the conversation. So on tonight's agenda, we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk about who are DAs and how do they use their power in our communities? And then Daniel is gonna come in and talk about the conference of DAs. What is their role at the legislature? What is their impact on our state? Then we'll have time for questions and answers. And then we'll talk about what's on the horizon, ways that you can become involved in the work that we're being uh, involved in. And then we will close out for the evening. So buckle up, we're about to get started. Who are DAs and how does their power really work? And we have a brief video that we're going to show you um, that breaks it down very quickly. And then we'll come back and discuss what we watched. Pop quiz, who is the most powerful and influential person in the criminal justice system? It's not a judge, it's your local elected prosecutor. Here's the secret about the American criminal justice system. About 97% of cases are resolved by plea bargain. The judge has almost no role in plea bargaining process. It's the prosecutor who decides whether you're gonna go to prison and for how long. Their daily decisions with regard to who to charge, how to charge them, and what prison sentence to seek has been one of the primary drivers of incarceration. So let's go back in time. Say it's 1980, you're caught for shoplifting, you're taken to court. You might be charged with a misdemeanor offense and get some community service. In 2017, the same charge might result in a felony and years in prison. How did we get here? Well, for years, prosecutors have acted with almost unchecked power. They're almost never hauled into the courtroom to answer for unaccountable practices. And the legislatures have handed prosecutors more and more power through harsh sentencing regimes, forcing people to accept plea bargains. Here's something that a lot of people don't know about district attorneys. Almost all of them are elected politicians. Prosecutors have stood in the way of criminal justice reform for decades. It's gonna take a major effort to shift that tide. But guess what? We're already starting to win. In 2016, we saw a new wave of prosecutors elected to office. Prosecutors who ran on an agenda of reducing incarceration and addressing racial disparities. In cities with district attorneys who support smart justice, they emphasize rehabilitation and treatment over severe punishment. They use scarce taxpayer dollars wisely to support approaches that are more humane and more effective than incarceration. During your next district attorney election, who are you gonna choose? All righty. So that- oh. Pop quiz. Lord, I'm sorry, hold on y'all, okay. So that brings us right into our discussion. I think Taylor did a really good job of breaking down that the fact that number one, DAs are elected in our local communities um, and they're the most influential actors in the carceral state because they have unlimited power to push for harsher punishments. Um, they often act in ways that are not visible to the general public. And what that means is when you are go to court, you can watch a trial but there aren't very many trials. There are lots of hearings that happen pre-trial um, and those hearings generally serve as you saw in the video to inform the plea bargaining process where 97% of cases, uh, including in North Carolina are negotiated in a back room, um, well, technically over email now, um, but not under the purview of the general public. And so um, again, judges who you elect uh, don't have a, a major role um, in that plea bargaining process. Um, and so again, DAs have a lot of unchecked power. Um, they largely focus on gaining convictions and securing severe prison sentences as opposed to what they really should be doing, right? Their mandate as prosecutors, as district attorneys is to seek justice. 
And more often than not, we see them seek punishment. And punishment doesn't always equal justice and it doesn't get us uh, where we actually need to be. It doesn't address the root causes of crime, which we know to be poverty and the absence of social infrastructures. Um, and this has led to far too many people being locked up for too long and contributes to our already racially disparate criminal legal system. Today, approximately one in 99 adults in this country are behind bars and millions more, like myself, are still attached to the carceral state. Some of us via pre parole and probation, but a lot of us is just be via the fact that we have a criminal history that continues to uh, prevent us from advancing and continues to deny us our full citizenship and the rights that are afforded to full citizens. And so a district attorney decides so many things. Number one, they decide, has there been a crime committed? Is there enough evidence to support a crime having been committed that supports the charges? And if there is a crime, do I dismiss that charge based on what I know? Or do I substantiate that charge and pursue that charge? Do I take it to trial? Do I not take it to trial? Now, I know that sounds simple like a choose your own adventure book that we used to read back in the day. Um, but these are very, very serious things for the people on the other side, because if your charge is not dismissed and you are then in a process of, of um, adjudicating your situation of being in adjudication, that is very stressful for a person. Oftentimes, poor Black people are not free while during this time period, they are being held on largely unaffordable money bonds that prevent them from even participating as uh, defendants uh, in their case uh, in meaningful ways. And so they also decide whose charges get diverted. So some folks might be charged with a felony and they can go to a diversion program. So at the end of that diversion program, the felony doesn't show up on their record. And so it's as if it never happened. Um, and then they also decide, well, that person doesn't uh, deserve that. And it's very arbitrary, the decisions. They decide which cops aren't going to testify or which ones do, or even if they keep a list. Uh, of people who can or cannot testify. And uh, the main reason why a law enforcement officer would not be able to testify is because they have been um, caught in a lie somewhere along the way. And so as a result of that lie, they are no longer able to testify on behalf of the state. Um, and another way that the DAs have a lot of decision is on whether to seek the death penalty or not. Um, and the death penalty um, in, in this country is rooted in uh, racism um, and disproportionately um, targets uh, and affects Black men, uh, especially here in North Carolina. And unique in North Carolina, and Daniel, I might need you to help me <laughs> out here, is the calendar control that the DAs have here in North Carolina. Um, so I, I want to say in other states, it is up to the clerk of court uh, when your trial or when your court dates are scheduled. Um, and here in North Carolina, it is the DA who decides that. And the rest of the court staff are really at the mercy of that district attorney. Am I explaining that right, Daniel? Yes, um, it is fairly uh, unique in North Carolina um, to have that sort of control uh, by a prosecutor. Um, and obviously it lends itself to um, abuse. Um, you know, the really the only sort of way to um, prevent it is that a judge do, can deny, uh, for example, a motion to continue. Um, but the practice is that they're generally not doing that. Um, but yes, a, uh, a prosecutor in North Carolina is uniquely able to decide, you know, when somebody goes to court, which, um, or, and it's not just sort of a meant to be in, uh, or can be an imposition on the individual who may be in confinement that entire time. And obviously it's very different when you're considering a plea deal uh, while you're in a cage uh, versus having your freedom. Um, but it's also a, a huge impact on uh, defense attorneys, you know, who may come uh, ready to um, have a trial that day, you know, after six months of preparation. And then uh, the DA, uh, you know, ask the court to, to continue the case and everything gets um, backed up even more. So that is a, a, a huge um, impact and something that is unique to North Carolina. Uh, and Christy, do you mind if I uh, talk a little bit about the dismissal practice? Because I think that is, um, you know, this is sort of the better known um, sort of toxic role of the DAs. But, um, but even here, people don't really um, understand just how coercive it can be where, you know, in that initial charging decision, 
um, you know, they're choosing whether to charge you with one count, whether to charge you with multiple counts, which, um, you know, uh, any real criminal offense a lot of times can give rise to multiple counts because the criminal laws overlap so much. Um, you know, they choose whether to charge you with possession or possession with intent to sell. Um, and so as much as North Carolina has really tried to um, uh, disempower judges uh, through structured sentencing, um, they've, uh, at the same time they've done that, they basically made the, the key decision what somebody is charged with. You know, at the very front, are they charged with multiple counts? Uh, how serious is the offense? And then even whether or not the, uh, the DA chooses to habitualize an offense. And because somebody has previous convictions of a certain type, they can choose to um, habitualize it and go after a uh, even firmer uh, or a harsher prison sentence. And, um, and a lot of times a judge is sort of, if the person is found guilty, uh, it depends on, the sentence depends on what they've been charged with and their previous convictions. And so it's really taken their discretion out of it and placed it solely with DAs. Thank you for that, Daniel, so much. And I saw y'all's chats about the black box. So I'll try to keep my mouse uh, off of the screen while I'm clicking. Okay, so to just to keep the conversation going so that we can set you guys up for the conversation that we're gonna have with Daniel in just a minute. So prosecutors largely controls who end up behind bars. Um, again, with them working within the plea deal system, they are able to take advantage of people taking deals to avoid the risk of longer sentences. And it's between 95 and, and it's some estimates, 97% of people who are incarcerated right now took plea deals. So the majority of people who are in your prison system right now, or even in your county jail, if they're serving a sentence less than six months, are took that through a plea deal. The majority of people do not go to trial. Um, and the other ways that uh, DAs largely harm the community is incarcerating the victims of crimes, uh, pressuring them to make false statements in order to charge the accused with more serious crimes, and even serve witnesses and victims false subpoenas and then arrest them for not following the demands of the fraudulent documents. And although, again, DAs are mostly elected, about 70% of them run unopposed for re-election. In addition to having tremendous legal powers, some district attorneys and prosecutors abuse the power of their offices. And in recent times, you may have heard of DAs like former Henderson, district, um, Henderson County District Attorney Greg Newman, who was removed from office because he was accused by several survivors of sexual assault of not allowing them to be heard in court. He represented three counties where more than a dozen families filed a motion in February to have him removed. And the court found that he was willful in his misconduct and was removed from the position of district attorney. Um, but Daniel, how often does that happen? Rare, uh, though it is unique to have that ability. I mean, that is a, um, you know, Obviously, that can be an incredible tool, and so we're starting to look at that, um, you know. But it's it, I just wonder if, um, with all the uh, sort of aggressive tactics and what I would call uh, abuses that you were talking about earlier, that are sort of built into the system, um, you know, I think it says a lot that um, you know Mr. Newman was uh, removed for um, not for prosecuting too many people, but just sort of that you know he didn't uh, listen to victims or um, or prosecute enough, and so. Um, yeah, it is rare, and I've never heard about it in regards to uh, an over-aggressive prosecutor going after uh, people. It's definitely not for an over-aggressive prosecutor. I think they are rewarded um, by winning elections for 20 and 30 years, am I not mistaken? Um, so Daniel, that does bring us to you uh, to explain to all of us, what is the Conference of DAs? And I will listen to you to tell me next slide whenever you want me to go to the next slide. Okay, thank you. Um, so what we've talked about so far is, you know, what people usually think about when they think of a local prosecutor. Um, charging decisions, obviously there's um, uh, a lot of huge issues there. Um, and even sort of on the local level, there can be some policy decisions. Um, for example, the DA usually plays a big role in um, what is a local bail policy. Um, but what I'm gonna talk about now is where with the North Carolina Conference of DAs, um, you know, that is a unique role and a very unknown role um, of local elected district attorneys because the North Carolina Conference of DAs is really the uh, state agency uh, that is meant to work on behalf of local elected DAs. And that's everything from, um, you know, training them on uh, prosecutorial tactics, 
um, and new information that's coming out, um, you know, sometimes actually providing um, staffing support. Uh, but a lot of what I've seen is a lobbyist at the North Carolina General Assembly, uh, first with the Second Chance Alliance and uh, the North Carolina Justice Center, and now with the ACLU, is the lobbying component of the North Carolina Conference of DAs. Next slide, please, Christy. So the North Carolina Conference of DAs, as I said, is, uh, and if you don't realize this, is a state agency. So it is uh, funded by uh, tax dollars. Um, and it has a uh, relatively uh, uh, large staff doing all of this sort of different activities I just described. Um, but one of the most uh, central roles of the conference um, is to uh, cooperate. I'm quoting this from the statute um, that actually empowers the DAs. The conference is meant to cooperate with citizens and other public and private agencies to promote the effective administration of justice. So from that delegation of authority, uh, they have uh, acted to, you know, um, oppose and defeat and be uh, a sort of gatekeeper on all things criminal justice in North Carolina, at least as long as I've uh, been at the legislature for the last 10 years. And uh, from what I've heard from others, you know, this is a long time role since it was developed in 1983. Um, you know, this means that, uh, where different policy proposals are being made, whether it's at the stage where, um, you know, local uh, or le legislators are just discussing it and seeing whether it's a viable idea, um, or it's actually been drafted and introduced as a bill, uh, you know, the conference of DAs, whether it's the state liaison, and I have a, a portrait of uh, 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 Chuck Spahos there, um, and, uh, you know, he is a staff person, uh, who is out there advocating on behalf of the DAs. Uh, and unfortunately, what we see is that uh, one, he, you know, and I have uh, respect for Chuck as a professional because he is working hard uh, on behalf of the DAs. Unfortunately, um, he's working hard to stop much needed bipartisan criminal justice reform in North Carolina. And so, um, you know, that's my uh, issue with the conference and not so much with um, Chuck himself, but the fact that uh, you know, he is able to uh, achieve uh, what is a very um, uh, antagonistic um, and reflexive um, and regressive um, legislative agenda uh, without the executive committee members of the conference or the all 42 elected DAs being held accountable for those policy decisions and what it means uh, in terms of harming uh, people's lives in their communities. And as Christy said, especially uh, uh, black people, uh, brown people, and indigenous individuals in these communities. So, um, you know, we are taking a more uh, a public uh, and aggressive approach to highlighting, um, you know, this problematic um, effort. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to just provide some examples of uh, situations where a bill has gotten far enough along to have a uh, to, be, to have been introduced and to have uh, bipartisan primary sponsors. So this is just a sample of the bipartisan uh, ideas and each one of these had enough support that it had a good chance of passing and some uh, we know would have passed but for the opposition of the DAs. Now I wanna um, you know, be clear that this is a sample. This, doesn't, this is not capturing all the times that for example, um, you know, DA Jim Woodall was in the uh, Trek Committee um, and, you know, was uh, uh, defeating uh, good policy ideas that would get bipartisan support um, as soon as they were sort of birthed. And so, you know, those uh, good ideas died in their cradle. These are ones that are actually got far enough to be introduced before, um, you know, the DA spoke out in a conference, uh, in a committee hearing. Um, or communicated their opposition to DAs. But either way, um, each one of these was uh, derailed uh, because of the North Carolina Conference of DAs. And I'll start first and foremost with the uh, bill to eliminate juvenile life without parole, which uh, was one of the most egregious examples of this, um, where you know North Carolina uh, and the well, United States is the only country in the world that uh, has uh, juvenile life without parole as a sentence. Um, but even in the United States, half of the states no longer use that practice. Um, and the reason they don't is self-evident in what you see in North Carolina. 
91% of the individuals who are currently serving uh, uh, life without parole who were sentenced as juveniles are people of color and 80% of those are black individuals. And so this is a extreme, um, uh, has an extreme racial uh, uh, inequity involved. And also it approaches the criminal justice system uh, and takes all of its worst assumptions and really what's it's got us toward mass incarceration, which is the idea that some people are unfixable, that no matter uh, who they are, what they do or what they see um, after a crime, that they cannot be, um, uh, you know, can never be accepted um, back in a society. And so um, that is a profound and, um, and I would say wrong thing to say to a child, uh, to somebody who is 17, no matter what they've done. And so it really is one of these, it plays out in real life examples where it, by defeating this bill that um, you know, had a primary sponsor, all four primary sponsors were Republicans, including the former police chief of, of Greensboro, uh, Faircloth, um, John Faircloth, uh, and yet, uh, you know, they were ambushed in committee and had the conference basically say uh, that some people are monsters uh, and that they should never get out, even if it's a um, at the review of a parole board. Um, and that's a common thing that we see, whether it's with judges or the parole board. Uh, you know, the DAs are willing to trust them on the front end, uh, but when you're talking uh, when you're talking about punishment and prosecution, but on the back end, when you're talking about expunctions or you're talking about parole. Uh, they just don't think that those um, decision makers and actors should be empowered to provide that relief. And so um, we see this throughout. Um, I'm not going to go through each one of those um, other than to highlight uh, the third one, because I think that's a, an interesting example where, you know, that's a bill that actually uh, passed the Senate um, uh, because the bill sponsors accommodated the opposition of the DAs. The DA said, you know, y'all are trying to uh, make local municipalities change it so that their ordinances are not enforced by class three misdemeanors, um, and which is a great idea. Uh, and I give a lot of props to Senator Muhammad um, and Senator Britt uh, for pushing that. But what the Conference of DA said was, um, you know, no, like for a lot of these crimes and especially the ones where you're talking about poverty or, and mental illness, we want that ability to scoop up people. Um, and what was so ironic here is that, um, and, and as a, uh, uh, Reverend Spearman said in the chat, um, that that is also, uh, that provision is also in Senate Bill 300. But what was so interesting there was they didn't, uh, the DAs did not want the list of sort of um, uh, types of ordinances that could um, no longer have a, um, a criminal penalty automatically attached to them. Um, you know, they didn't mind it being shrunk in certain ways um, and even around a lot of those poverty offenses. But what they wanted was the ability to actually um, allow law enforcement to arrest the person and bring them into court. And basically the compromise they made was once they get to court, if the person hasn't um, been in trouble uh, since then, then the, that's an affirmative defense they can use to have the charge um, to basically be found not guilty of the charge. And so again, you see there that even where uh, you know, the, uh, the conference doesn't see these as serious crimes, they still want the authority to seize control of someone's body and remove them um, from a space. And, you know, and that's just sort of uh, par for the course. Um, I'll end by just highlighting that, that this is not something new. Um, I think it's much more aggressive um, and uh, uh, effective since uh, Chuck came on board. But, you know, we've seen these practices for um, a decade. Everything from raise the age legis legislation where we were the last in the country to stop uh, prosecuting 16 year olds automatically as adults. The DAs were behind everybody else on that. Um, it made it more difficult process. We still see that today where they um, are one of the groups that's responsible for um, you know, keeping us from raising the minimum age of juvenile jurisdiction from six to 12. Uh, they uh, came out strongly against that. And so as usually happens, the public policy conversation adjusted um, and so now the only conversation being had is uh, six to 10. Um, we see it with the Racial Justice Act that they were the biggest entity that ended up having that um, repealed um, as soon as they could. And uh, similar to that, you know, we believe that they, uh, we know that they have uh, been one of the major um, actors that has preserved the death penalty because one, um, it is a tool that many DAs still use to uh, execute people. But beyond that, again, a lot of this is about plea deals. And if you can hang the threat of death over somebody's um, head 
uh, it will make them uh, uh, aggressively seek relief in, maybe in ways they might not otherwise do. Um, and then finally, I'll say even with the Second Chance Act, which is you know passed last year, something that uh, uh, that I'm proud of, a lot of uh, advocates are proud of, but a lot of legislators and even DAs are proud of it. But you know that took two years to pass. Um, the DAs came out strongly against it, um, not because of um, necessarily a public interest uh, uh, component, because expunctions have been adapted to allow subsequent prosecutions, um, but really because they wanted the collateral consequences to attach. They wanted employers to know, um, you know about those, every detail of those charges. And so it took a lot to get them to the table. Um, and even once we uh, got uh, explicit support of the conference, what you see a lot of times is individual DAs reaching out to even where we get the support of the conference, uh, they stop progress. Uh, next slide, please, Christine. This is uh, my last one. Well, actually, I have two more. Um, so these are just examples, um, and this is actually linked um, at this. There's a hyperlink there, and that's the name of an article that Policy Watch did uh, a few weeks ago, asking, uh, you know, what we should all be asking, what policymakers should, should certainly be asking: Are North Carolina district attorneys a roadblock to need criminal justice reform? And uh, yes, and, and as I'd say, they're living a resounding yes. Um, and this is just one example. And in the version we send out to, um, uh, to you all after this, um, we'll have a, a clearer version of that document. Um, but it, again, it's hyperlinked, at, uh, it's linked at that um, hyperlink there. Uh, but this is from the Legislative Black Caucus, basically criticizing the Conference of DAs for uh, single-handedly defeating uh, the bill to eliminate juvenile life without parole. And so again, um, it's not just us saying this, uh, legislators are feeling the impact of this and especially in this time where there's so much momentum uh, for reform, uh, you know, it, it's, it sounds like I'm being hyperbolic when I say this, but it is my true opinion that the North Carolina Conference of District Attorneys are the single biggest obstacle to achieving racial, uh, of course, I would have been able to say this. This is going to be my big uh, uh, statement, but um, they really are the biggest um, obstacle to achieving racial equity in the criminal justice system, um, as far as I can see. You know, and, and maybe there's a contest between them and the North Carolina Sheriff's Association. Um, but either way, uh, at this point, they have become a very toxic actor in that policymaking conversation. Next slide, please. And again, this is an example um, from last time, uh, you know, from last session, because again, I don't want to act like this is a, something new that the Conference of DAs is doing. Um, and again, we'll make sure this is a little bit clear when we send it out. But this is an example of during the conversation about the Second Chance Act, um, which again, ended up passing without a single vote against it in the legislature. Um, what you see is uh, uh, a uh, District Attorney Mike Miller, who is uh, uh, Speaker Moore's local district attorney, reaching out to him uh, to say in the middle of these debates about the Second Chance Act, you know, Act about expunctions, which was a very limited bill, uh, to basically, you know, illustrate in a way that is rarely articulated in this manner, um, how profoundly regressive uh, the Conference of District Attorneys is at this point. And so I'm just going to uh, quickly read uh, this one excerpt from it, because I think it does um, uh, just illustrate that, and I'll turn it back over to Christy. According to Cleveland and Lincoln District Attorney Mike Miller uh, in 2019, he said, my job is to protect law-abiding citizens of my district, not worry about collateral civil consequences. This is just one more way for groups like this to obviate the need for personal accountability in society. It is not the defendant's fault that he committed a crime and went to prison. It is a system's fault per Bose's website. Year after year, groups like this continue to chip away at the concept of personal accountability. We should be standing with the 99% of the population that does not commit a crime. We need to stop allowing the tail to wag the dog. We were elected to represent a tr truth and justice. And yes, justice may include a second chance, but at a point, a line must be drawn and I believe we have reached that point. Now, from hearing that uh, rant, you may assume that, uh, you know, one, there's no crime in Cleveland and Lincoln County, since 99% of the population is not committing crimes, um, which again is uh, uh, farcical. Um, but beyond that, you would think that apparently people are getting expunctions in, uh, in these counties. No, they're not. He made this statement and we went and looked at how many people had gotten um, an expunction of a conviction um, in Lincoln County. 
it was less than 10. So apparently that's the line uh, where he thought the tails would be wagging the dog if you, uh, you know, that it was enough to give those 10 individuals a second chance. And again, you know, I don't uh, want to um, exaggerate this, but I want to use this as an, an example of the sentiment that we see constantly, whether it's Mike Miller in Cleveland County or it's somebody who represents themselves as a progressive DA, like Lauren Freeman in Wake County. Now, I'm not comparing those two um, completely, but I would say the policy uh, positions and efforts that and advocacy efforts that we see at the legislature um, is much closer to what you see here with Mike Miller um, uh, by the DAs and that we see uh, progressive DAs, again, whether it's Jim Woodall out of Orange and Chatham or uh, Lauren Freeman um, and others pursuing these uh, regressive policies and not being held accountable for them locally. All right, thank you, Daniel, for telling us number one, who the conference of DAs are, and number two, the ways in which they block progress here in North Carolina. Daniel gave y'all a lot of information, but to boil it all down, too long didn't read, they are blocking progress. They are maintaining racial disparities. They are maintaining a Jim Crow-esque system that disproportionately targets black, brown, and poor North Carolinians. And they do that with surgical precision the same way they gerrymandered, the same way they suppressed votes, like all of the things that happen to black and brown folks uh, in the streets are definitely happening to black and brown folks at the policy tables. And so um, you have to understand that even if we had a saying in the streets that if you're not on the table, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, I'm at the table and we still on the menu. And that's where we are right now in North Carolina. Like I'm at the table and we, I'm seeing us uh, still on the menu. And so we are in a dire, dire time uh, here. We're at a, 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 at a turning point, really. We had a fork in the road of where do we go uh, for the future in North Carolina? And so we have a vision here at the ACLU of what the future could look like. And we are going to lay out very briefly uh, what that vision could look like. So of course, our ultimate goal is to see the abolishment of the harmful, intrusive carceral state and to see the state's assets reallocated, the resources that we, the people, have accumulated to see those things reallocated directly to our communities. But until that happens, because that's the ultimate goal, but until we get there, what, what we know is that DAs can and should protect justice and those that are most susceptible to injustice. We have seen transformational DE, DEA, DAs elected all over the country who ran on platforms of ending mass incarceration and addressing racism and um, racial disparities in their offices. These DAs have also committed to ensuring that the social, political, and economical issues that are at the root of a defendant's issues are addressed. So what is a transformational prosecutor? Well, a transformational prosecutor is someone who could or should support safe pretrial release for people, advocate for alternatives to incarceration, hold law enforcement accountable, protect and support rather than punish children, consider all of the immigration consequences that a defendant may face. Conviction review unit which means basically when they're reviewing who's convicted, uh, the, the demographics to ensure that the charging practices are uniform throughout the office, that there are not certain groups of folks who are receiving preferential treatment from the district attorneys in an office. Um, advocate for community-based services for those with mental health issues rather than locking them up. Prioritize truth, justice, and community rather than convictions, but mainly what we want them to do is work on across the board decarceration, including people who have been involved in acts of violence at some point. Because to Daniel's point, harm is historical. Harm has always existed in the world and will always exist in this world. But it's only very recently that we began disappearing and disconnecting people from their aut autonomy and agency. And we have not done anything to achieve what we said we wanted to achieve. If we were getting towards public safety, if jails and prisons were a deterrent for crime and violence, they would be empty, we would have no homicides, we would be safe. Um, and that is just not happening, despite the mass and over-incarceration of Black, Brown, and poor people. So hopefully you guys have some questions 
for us. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that the black box does not pop up when I try to check the chat and see what you all have may have placed in the chat. Uh, and Daniel and I will look at these questions. So here's a really simple question. Who makes up the conference? Are they all district attorneys? Daniel, do you wanna break it down really quickly? Yes, um, so it is a state agency. So um, it is not voluntary um, that each of the 42 elected district attorneys has a seat at the table. And um, the most involved with the statewide policy conversation are members of the executive committee, um, but all 42 are a part of the conference. Um, and, you know, it is not voluntary. They can't um, withdraw, um, but they can speak up. All right, thank you. So um, there's a question from the chat, Daniel. Is there or why hasn't there been a push for progressive reform-minded prosecutors in North Carolina? I see that you were typing an answer, but I don't think you got to it. Yeah, and I, well, I just sent it out, uh, oh. and I'm curious what you would say about that. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, and even as we were preparing this, we were debating the terms about progressive versus transformative because, um, you know, with the carceral system as uh, pervasive it is, as it is and is sort of um, how we're immersed in it, it is um, hard to, you know, really, um, uh, be a progressive prosecutor. Um, you know, you're acted out, you know, the rest of the system actors um, immediately try to isolate you um, and undermine you. And so um, there's already that of whether somebody's willing to take on that fight once they've been elected. Um, but even before that, like the idea of running for a, um, uh, to be a DA against an incumbent, as Christy said, 70% of DA races are not even contested. And that's because, you know, as a, uh, usually the person who's running, is also an attorney whose uh, livelihood depends on good relationships with the DA, the judge, the clerks. And you can really put that at risk um, when you enter a race um, like the DA's race. And so I think that um, there's a lot of reasons why people um, you know, would be reasonable in not running for it, but that's why it takes a lot of community um, support um, and uh, enthusiasm for uh, progressive DAs. But I do wanna acknowledge that whether somebody's progressive or not, there are there's a wide range of DAs and some are better than others. Like I wouldn't call uh, DA Merriweather out of Mecklenburg a progressive DA, but I would certainly um, appreciate many of the approaches that he's taken and consider them to be progressive. I'm curious as a Mecklenburg resident and somebody who has been prosecuted by the Mecklenburg DA's office, uh, how you, and, and even in fact, DA Merriweather, uh, how do you feel about that? I'm not getting ready to drag Spencer on this thing. I, what I will say is that, yes, all that Daniel said is true. The current DA prosecuted me. Uh, and uh, I have I would say we have a, a OK working relationship, a, a good working relationship, because of this this is the thing. A DA is a DA, right? And they're only going to do so much. And then we also have to have the nuanced conversation of black DAs the way that systemic oppression and racialized terror continue to exist in this country, that black district attorneys are still subject to, to racism, to voters, you know, holding them to a standard that is different than the, their white counterparts. And so I'm always hesitant to drag a black DA when there have been however many years here in North Carolina of white DAs that have built the wall of mass incarceration. Um, but I will say that uh, Spencer, may not be a Satana de Berry, uh, but he does what he can and should um, to ensure the longevity of his uh, tenure inside of the, the district attorney's office. And so I, I don't know, like I can't say anything about it because again, this is a black man working in a, a system that was not designed for him to even participate in, that he is not five fifths in, he's still three fifths, even as a black prosecutor. Um, so there's that. Um, and yeah, and, and because they have to oftentimes to be in that space to progress, oftentimes the black folks have to outperform their white counterparts. And so they have to be seen as more punitive and more tough on crime in order to even be seen as someone who is not, um, you know, playing the race card or, you know, you know, all, all kinds of things. So that's what I would say about progressive DAs. Let me move along uh, though. So- Can I ask you a question, Christy? Okay, sure. Christy, um, so uh, responding to Ashley's question, um, how would you go about recruiting somebody uh, to run for, uh, to be a local DA? Um, you know, are there certain groups you're looking at? Um, yeah, just when you're thinking about that, how would you go about it? 
Uh, well, so when somebody complains to me about the DA, I ask them why they haven't run. Like I, a defense attorney can't come to me complaining about the DA if they haven't put their name on the ballot mm -hmm. because you have to be the change that you want to see. I didn't go to law school. I don't have a law degree. If I did, I might be the DA. You know what I mean? And so like, mm -hmm. if you don't like what you're seeing, if you have complaints about the way the justice is being administered or the courtroom is running, then what, regardless of your party or who you, where you're affiliated, if you think you can do better, then you should put your name on that ballot. There is no excuse for 70% of the folks running unopposed. You know, but everybody has complaints every election season uh, or all through the year about their district attorney. And so uh, the way that I recruit is when they complain, I ask them, why haven't they ran? And they always complain about the district attorney because I start complaining and then so they can start complaining. And then I ask them, why you ain't ran? You know, <laughs> so that's how I start the conversation. And then you hear lots of things like there are lots of barriers um, that people have to running. Um, and especially for criminal defense attorneys who sometimes make an awful lot of money going into public service, working for the state is a huge pay cut um, that they just aren't interested in. Uh, that's fiscally irresponsible to some of them is what I see. Um, but to move along in these questions in the comments, Andy had a good question. He says that he was in, a, he served on a jury in Wake County on an arson case. There, there was an acquittal, but he wanted to protest because the case never should have been brought. It was based only on a coerced confession with no evidence, no motive, and the detective who coerced the confession probably was racist. I'm not laughing because I was just, it was, yeah, anyway. I thought the ADA or DA who decided to bring the case ought to be punished. Would that have been possible or is it ever possible? Can the DA be sued? So, uh, not that I'm aware uh, that the DA can be sued. Um, I'm a little bit reluctant to answer that. I've not heard of a DA being uh, sued. I should uh, say that we had we talked about the um, uh, the uh, approach earlier, where you can actually recall basically a DA um, and have them um, for various uh, reasons. And it's actually, uh, if you look at the definition, it's actually pretty um, broad. Um, and, and, you know, just inappropriate use of discretion or something that brings disrepute um, to the office of the uh, DA. Um, in those circumstances, they can be uh, recalled from office. And so um, that's uh, one way, again, um, that does not happen very often. Um, the, you know, one of the other approaches is to basically work with other systems actors, other stakeholders uh, to criticize the practice of the local DA um, and to, um, you know, ask them and to basically make ask of them. So to work with the public defender's office um, to advocate for some of those policy changes or at least um, some sort of scrutiny on the DA, um, to work with a chief district court judge um, who in some ways can hold a local DA um, accountable um, but, but again, it's, they are the most powerful actor in the criminal justice system. And as Taylor said in the original video, even where you see them hiding evidence, um, uh, you know, and there's some very notable cases uh, of some uh, uh, very powerful DAs in North Carolina and including within the leadership of the conference uh, that have clearly uh, uh, Jim O'Neill, just say his name. That, that, that have uh, <laughs> clearly not acted the way that you would want a uh, public servant and an official uh, to do that. And it really just, you know, uh, their main goal was to preserve the conviction instead of doing justice. And so um, we repeatedly see that. So unfortunately, there are not many ways to um, hold them accountable uh, beyond uh, the ba ballot box. Um, and again, um, without good candidates running, that's all ready. Um, you know, that's a hard ask. I saw that there was a question about, you know, again, how do you uh, persuade people to run um, in a system that's so broken? And what I would say is that, again, the, the DA is the most powerful actor. So as much as they can be sort of um, undermined or, um, you know, or just uh, there can be obstructions put in their way, that they still have incredible power and more than any other stakeholder in the system. And so even with the obstructions that uh, individuals face, they can still do a lot of good. I mean, a couple of years ago, um, this group of DAs, which is, I promise you, is, uh, you know, have told me that they identify as conservative, um, dismissed more than a million pending charges. Um, just because again, in this in the system that just is so harmful in so many ways uh, that even conservative uh, uh, DAs who take a very conservative approach and are all too willing to uh, prosecute and cage people um, saw that it made sense to dismiss 
you know, 25 year old traffic charges that have been causing somebody to have a driver's license suspension for 25 years. Um, and so again, uh, especially in their charging decisions, uh, they have incredible power. Um, so that's a real incentive uh, to jump in. Okay. And so Barbara asks, is the Conference of DAs voluntary or appointed? So if you, when you are elected to, uh, as a DA, you are entered into the conference by default. Correct, gang? I mean, that's mm -hmm. basically like yeah, you're yeah. elected as a DA, so now you're part of the Conference of DAs. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't, yeah. And how much you participate, I think, is up to you or not, but still, uh, you still are a member of that conference. Um, and so the second part of Ashley, uh, Ashley's question, though, Daniel, is what are the characteristics of a decent and just DA? What should we yep. be looking for? What do we talk about? Uh, Chris and I talk about this all the time, that um, whether it's at the legislature or um, different court actors, um, you know, one thing that would have a hugely impactful um, or just would cause a huge impact is actually someone who spent time in a cage, who did not have autonomy of their body, um, you know, who was, um, you know, went through the, the plea process and, and um, was just sort of in that situation where they were powerless. Um, a lot of these individuals um, who are making these decisions are, uh, you know, so far away from that feeling of being powerless and sort of trapped in a system um, that, you know, it adds the hubris uh, and uh, again, sort of the disconnect. So I think that one, an impacted person um, is someone I would look at, um, someone who has um, been in that cage and, and, and understood what it means um, to suffer in that unique way. Because again, we've just become so comfortable with the idea of uh, putting somebody in that cage. And then beyond that, um, you know, someone who, uh, knows the criminal justice system. Like you have to, um, uh, you don't have to, but it, it's a huge uh, benefit to actually know um, how to run a courtroom before you become the DA and how to run a, a, a trial. Um, you know, what are the uh, different ways that you can uh, take mass dismissals? Um, so someone who is um, familiar enough with the system, um, both, you know, whether having gone through it, but also the mechanisms of prosecution um, that on day one, uh, they can, uh, you know, run with it. Now, the, the third and last thing I'd say is a fighter and somebody who's going to hold um, other court actors accountable and also their staff. Because what I see is um, individuals, uh, one of the biggest problems is that even a progressive DA is generally constantly undermined by their staff. Um, that, uh, you know, whether you're in a small office like Durham, where you have about 20 people, or um, what Larry Krasner talks about in Philadelphia, where you have an office of more than 100 prosecutors, um, the ability to communicate your ideas in a persuasive way, but then hold, you know, create structures of accountability to hold your ADAs accountable and make sure that they're just not falling back on the, the same old practices and incentives that are inherently there. Um, so I think those are the three things. Uh, that I would recommend. And, and again, it's hard to find. Okay. Um, and so someone asked, does the conference corrupt legislators with entertainment, drinks, and money? What's that? I'm sorry. Does, does, does any, are the <laughs> legislators being corrupted by the conference of DAs? Are they being wooed with money, drinks, gifts, <laughs> things of that nature? Uh, this is the 1990s uh, at the GA. Uh, no, I mean, I think it's just that um, uh, that there's a lot of deference given to the DAs and, um, you know, and the sheriffs because they can bring up examples like they can very quickly articulate the worst case um, example or, you know, uh, that something that will happen one out of a million times, but that's the face they put on it. So one, they can, um, are, you know, articulate um, uh, just a you know, uh, um, an argument uh, against reform, even as flimsy as it may be, that the other actors and actors in the system aren't committed enough to it to just sort of run over that concern. And so the DAs are willing to get out there and fight uh, to keep the system as is. And unfortunately, in, the, in just where we are now, other system actors, uh, whether you're talking about the governor um, or the attorney general, are not willing to confront them as bad actors in this process. Um, and so that's a um, uh, highly problematic. And um, was there a second part of that question? Because I feel like I, there was, okay. Mm -mm. Um, no. Uh, and then uh, the last question that we can take before we run out of time is, 
uh, when you when we wanted to abolish JL WAP, did we offer an alternative sentence to JL WAP? And what would the alternative be? Um, and yeah, so, it was an extended. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, the big thing with that one was um, it was an extensive sentence and basically said that after a certain amount of time, and off the top of my head, I think it was 20 years, um, that after a certain amount of time, an individual who had been um, uh, convicted, already convicted of juvenile life without parole, um, if they had served a, at least, and I, yeah, I think it was 15 okay. or 20 years, yeah. um, then uh, the parole commission could see their case. It doesn't mean they're, you know, they're getting out. Are, and that's all. And, and the parole board has its own issues. They don't let out nearly enough people. So it, it, it's problematic for many uh, ways. But the, the essence of the uh, juvenile life without parole bill was just to say, after an extended amount of time, um, that a person who entered the system as a child has served a prison sentence. At that point, we're going to we're going to give these um, system actors just a chance to review their case and see if they can be allowed um, to be released under parole. So again, they would still be under state supervision. So um, again, that's what's most uh, concerning here is uh, the idea that under no circumstances uh, should certain people um, ever uh, be allowed a chance at rehabilitation or reentry. Um, and that's, you know, just fundamentally wrong. Well, y'all, we are coming to the end of, you know, the road. Of tonight. Y'all know y'all have so many more questions, but we did this on purpose because we wanted to whet your appetite so that you would attend our next event that will be coming up. And at the next event, we will reveal the areas in which we think we will be able to build power to make change. Uh, and there are some geographies, Daniel, that we are excited to begin working deeply in. Uh, there are already people on the ground in these communities that are working. Um, and so what we will do is we will connect with um, uh, folks on the ground in those communities to build power, to provide education, resources, and all of those things um, so that we can all work together to be the change that we want to see. So again, at our next event, we will discuss what areas in North Carolina are of particular concern with bad actors. You'll find out who those actors are, where they're located, what you can do, and how to be impactful. Um, and so we thank you for attending tonight. Uh, we want to be respectful of your time. We know that it's a, an hour um, in your evening and that you are spending away from your family, probably after a day of work, and we want to respect that. I will put my email uh, in the chat along with Daniel's email. Daniel, you put your email in the chat if you want to. Okay. Of nc.org and you can email us we will also be having a volunteer training coming up on august the 12th and you can learn how to be more deeply involved with the campaign for smart justice and the renegade advocacy you will see how we confront district attorneys the conference of da's if you want to come to the legislature daniel and i are there Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, all the way until probably mid-September at this point. Daniel, what are we thinking? Probably mid-September. Yeah, think so, so if you want to come up, email me. Uh, we will have some assistance if you need to drive, such as in the form of gas cars and things like that. And we would love to host you, to show you around the building, uh, to introduce you to Chuck Spayhos, and you can ask him why he blocked juvenile parole, juvenile life without parole yourself and see the type of answer he gives you. Um, and you can see other state actors who have been making some good decisions and some bad decisions, and you can uh, feel free to advocate in the way in which you see fit. Uh, we invite you, we welcome you. We sit in the 1200 court. Uh, the building is at 15 West Jones Street. You come through, don't bring any whole bunch of stuff because they go through your bags. You got to go through security now. But once you make it through security, find the 1200 court right outside of Pricey Harris's office, the representative from Guilford, you will find Daniel, myself, and our colleagues. Again, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate your support. If you are not a member of the ACLU, please go to www.aclu.aclu.nc.org slash membership and become a member for as little as $5 a month so that you can uh, receive emails and stay abreast of what's happening. We are going to sign off. And if you are in the Raleigh area or want to come to the General Assembly and see us tomorrow, pop up on us, pull up on me. Bye.